you for downloading this episode of our podcast. Hi, and welcome to the podcast for Solomon Staircase Masonic Lodge number 357, where we talk about all things related with Freemasonry, including Hermetic teachings, philosophy, reason, spirituality, and much more. We're located in Buena Park, Southern California. Tune in as we continue to update our podcast with informative talks and articles for Masons worldwide and those who would like to inquire within. Okay, so for this episode, we are going to share the articles from the Fall 2021 California Freemason Magazine. And the theme of this month's magazine, or this issue of the magazine, was Bridge Builders, How Masons Create Durable, Adaptable, and Meaningful Relationships. So we'll start with the cover story, which is Spanning the Divide by Laura Bennis, How to Repair a Lodge and Restore Harmony. Past Grandmaster Rush Charvonia remembers exactly where he was on Highway 101 when he decided to pick up the phone and apologize. My heart was beating fast as I dialed, says Charvonia, who at the time was still coming up the fraternity's ranks. I thought, is this the right thing to do? It's going to make me look like a fool. A recent conflict at his lodge, Channel Islands number 214, had been eating at him. To be fair, it was more like a one-sided war than a conflict, with Charvonia an army of one. Not long before, during the turbulent time, a new master had stepped in to lead the lodge. Right away, something about him set Charvonia off. To put it bluntly, Charvonia says, I had made my mind up. This guy is a real jerk. This went on for months, until one day Charvonia witnessed an interaction between him and another member. It ran against everything he'd been telling himself. He was treating this brother with such care and compassion, he says. The old narrative crumbled. Charvonia realized that if there was any jerk in the lodge, it was him. Now, speeding along Highway 101, he knew he wanted to do something about it. When his fellow lodge member picked up the phone, Charvonia didn't waste any time. Worshipful, I owe you an apology, he said. I judged you when I shouldn't have. On the other end of the line, the member listened. He gave Charvonia all the time he needed to say his piece. When Charvonia was done, he forgave him. And then he did him one better. He went on to become one of Charvonia's most trusted advisors. It's a lesson Charvonia thinks about whenever he sees members struggling with conflict. What if he hadn't swallowed his pride and picked up the phone that day? What if he just let things take their course? That phone call didn't just preserve a relationship, he says. It built a foundation. Fixing the Cracks In any builder's foundation, minor cracks can eventually lead to major problems. It starts in a number of ways. A mistake during construction, a catastrophic event, the simple wear and tear of time. If you spot a crack early, you might be able to repair it yourself. Let it go too long and the damage will almost certainly get worse. After enough time, it can bring down the whole structure. That's the case with Masonic Lodges too. You can usually sense the minute you walk into a lodge if there's a conflict, says Gary Silverman, past master of Saddleback Laguna Lodge number 672. It's almost palpable. There's a fracture. You can see it in the dining room. There's a group over here and a group over there, and never the twain shall meet. Silverman should know. As a crisis management consultant, he's made a career out of conflict resolution. He intervenes with businesses experiencing explosive growth or about to go under, helping CEOs and other leaders work through their issues to build healthier teams. He now takes the same lessons for struggling businesses and applies them to lodges. At Masonic leadership retreats, he often gathers lodge leaders in candid, confidential discussions about the problems keeping them up at night. Over the years, he's visited many of their lodges to facilitate conflict resolution. As a result, he's been around more lodge discord than most. He's seen conflicts that started as innocent misunderstandings hardened into grudges. He's seen conflicts caused by the pressure a lodge experiences during a time of growth or change. He's seen conflicts about money and status and personality clashes. More than that, he's seen them start with someone who simply wants to be heard. Interpersonal conflicts usually come from a common issue. Somebody has a desire to contribute, and they're not being allowed to, he says. Often, all the person wants is to be listened to and have their opinion valued. Whatever the circumstances, take it from Silverman. Conflicts don't just flare up at troubled lodges or growing lodges, old lodges or new. They happen everywhere. No matter what the cause of such problems is, learning to address them is one of the most important issues a lodge faces. 
In membership surveys, Masons consistently say that issues related to lodge harmony, interpersonal relationships, politicking, and bickering are the greatest contributor to their overall feelings toward the fraternity. Those who feel heard and respected remain active. Those who don't tend to drift away. For many lodge leaders, navigating the tangle of intra-lodge beefs isn't just challenging. It can feel totally outside their skill set. Yet a lodge master's greatest responsibility isn't just balancing the books or organizing events, it's maintaining lodge harmony. Luckily, Silverman says, the tools they need are all available within the context of Masonic teaching. When Silverman meets with members who are at odds, he usually begins with a question. Why did you join? If members can focus on that shared experience, they might find the motivation to stick around and talk. Both parties must be invested in a resolution, Silverman says. In other words, they have to care enough about the relationship to begin the hard work of fixing it. For that to happen, they often need to recognize that they share a common goal. That gets the focus where it needs to be. Once they agree to that, it's a matter of following the lessons every candidate learns in the first degree. Meet each other on the level, part on the square, walk uprightly. Of course, like most of Masonry's lessons, this is easier said than done. Hard Talks To mend a damaged relationship, a lodge needs the courage to sit down and talk about the problem. And for that to be successful, it might need some help from a skilled facilitator, or, at the very least, some practice with difficult conversations. So in 2014, when he became Grand Master, Charvonia made difficult conversations something of a mission. He was troubled by the increasingly divisive rhetoric in the news and on social media. He knew that Masons could do better. So he devoted his Grand Master's term to forming and launching the Masonic Family Civility Project, hosting discussion forums and sharing resources for promoting respectful, productive discourse between Masons and non-Masons alike. The discussion model takes Masonic concepts like equality, tolerance, and brotherly love and puts them through their paces. It typically features a group of five seated in a half circle, representing different viewpoints on a hot-button issue. The goal at the end of the 45-minute discussion isn't to solve a problem or change anyone's mind. It's simply to practice hearing one another and responding with respect, even on a topic that makes everyone see red. Charvonia applies the same strategies to help lodges navigate personal conflict. When he visits a lodge to talk through a problem, he begins by asking everyone to make a commitment to remaining civil. Then he opens up the floor. In the ensuing discussion, he chimes in occasionally, but only to keep things on track. He reminds members to restate what they've heard before rushing to respond. He coaches them to use I statements instead of the sweeping declarations about others or you statements. Crucially, he asks everyone to allow for the possibility that they might be wrong. How many times, with our kids, our partners, our lodges, does it become a battle to be right, he says. That's not conducive to harmonious relationships. So much of getting along with one another is giving people the grace to be wrong. Many times, by the end of these conversations, Charvonia senses a shift. The more people feel heard, the more they're willing to listen. The more they feel acknowledged, the less they care about winning. Charvonia sees members genuinely try to put themselves in one another's shoes. Perhaps best of all, he watches their mutual respect deepen, even among those who remain on opposite sides of an issue. These changes may be subtle. Reconciliation takes time. But for many, even a small course correction can point the way back to harmony. Oftentimes, the lodge may wind up stronger than it started. As Masons, we make a commitment to each other to do what it takes to build rewarding, productive relationships, Charvonia says. That's all Masonry is. It's how we can be more intertwined to achieve greater good for this world. It's about relationships. Back to basics. Masonry talks a lot about how to build a lodge. It talks less about how to fix one. But the same tools for building are used to make repairs. Take the square and the plum. They remind Masons to treat one another fairly and with respect. That's the way out of almost any conflict. In times of turmoil, they're more important than ever. I've heard it said, a lodge should be a place where armor is neither required nor rewarded, says Chris Smith, a district inspector and member of Peninsula Number 168. To Smith, that gets at the whole point of Masonic Harmony. For us to really be able to focus on improving ourselves and on the principles of the fraternity, we need the lodge to be a safe space, he says. When a lodge fractures, it's hard to feel safe. Members' instincts turn to fight or flight. Instead of opening up, they withdraw. For a time, they lose their safe space, but more than most, Masons have the tools to repair something that's broken, including themselves. 
In these moments, Smith turns to the symbol of the rough and perfect Ashlars, that lifelong work in progress. There are so many lofty ideals for us to struggle toward, he says. Everyone has their own Ashlar that they're working with, trying to knock off all the pointy edges that cause injury to others. Basically, when it's time to repair a relationship, it takes both sides admitting that they still have some rough edges and that they care enough about the future of the Lodge to keep chipping away. Harmony isn't a passive act, Smith says. It requires diligence. You have to try. Brotherly love is not a secret sauce. It takes work. But then, that's the point of masonry, to tackle the work together. Is Forgiveness Manly? Why Letting Go of Grudges is the Strongest Move of All by Brett and Kate McKay No answer still, I thrust a torch through, the remaining aperture and I let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. On the account of the dampness of the catacombs, I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pas, requiscat. In the cask of Amontillado, Edgar Allan Poe paints a haunting picture of one man's mission of revenge. After bearing a thousand injuries and a grievous insult, Montresor decides he must punish his antagonist, Fortunato, with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser, says Montresor. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done him wrong. And so, under the guise of seeking his opinion on some amontillado, Montresor lures Fortunato deep into the cold, damp catacombs. When they arrive at a niche in the walls, Montresor chains Fortunato to a rock and slowly begins to wall up the enclave brick by brick, leaving the stunned and confused nobleman inside to die a slow and agonizing death. Montresor's revenge is complete. The idea of justified revenge is one of the most common themes in literature, movies, comic books, and even video games. From the Count of Monte Cristo to the Punisher to Red Dead Revolver, revenge is often the driving force behind our most popular stories. For thousands of years, we have cheered the manly and heroic character who personally sought to avenge the wrong done to him or to his loved ones. The more perfect and complete his plot for revenge, the colder the dish served. The more delicious and admirable we find it. When the evildoers finally get their comeuppance, we are filled with vicarious satisfaction. The great satisfaction we derive from stories of revenge is understandable. Revenge played a healthy role for much of our evolutionary history. Within tribes, revenge ensured that misdeeds were punished and deterred would-be wrongdoers from committing egregious acts in the first place. Eye for an eye. It was a rudimentary but effective way to mete out justice. And since it was men carrying out this basic form of law enforcement, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that our brains appear to be hardwired towards justice. So if the desire to seek revenge comes so naturally, why should we attempt forgiveness? Is forgiveness manly? What does it mean to forgive? As men, I think we often resist the idea of forgiveness because it seems contrary to the idea of justice and because it seems like an action born of weakness. After all, many people equate forgiveness with letting someone off the hook and allowing them to get away with wrongdoing. Doesn't the lack of just punishment encourage the person to commit the same act again and put us in the position of condoning their crime? And if so, is forgiveness for suckers, for pushovers? But true forgiveness shouldn't involve ignoring the issues of justice. It does not preclude justified anger. It shouldn't be a get-out-of-jail-free card you bestow upon everyone willy-nilly. It is not something you agree to simply avoid conflict. It should not involve being a doormat who allows someone to hurt you over and over again. It is not the same as reconciliation, and it does not mean that you forget what has happened, nor that you automatically trust a person again. What it does mean is that you let go of both your ill feelings towards the offender and your need to personally balance the scales of justice. It's a process whereby the antagonism you feel for the offender is replaced with compassion. Sound sissy? It's not. In fact, summoning the strength to forgive someone can increase your manliness in a variety of ways. Forgiveness shows maturity. The reason it's easy to cheer for revenge in a movie is that typically the plot is set up in a very black and white way. The hero is an admiral and virtuous guy. The villain is pure evil and kills the hero's family simply because his heart is black as a lump of coal. Of course, the real world is rarely so simplistic. Seeing things in black and white is generally reserved for children. At a certain point, the boy must become a man. 
Maturity involves the ability to step into another person's shoes and see things from a different perspective. It requires a mind that understands the human condition and recognizes people as truly complex creatures with frailties, failures, and checkered histories. You need not condone the wrong someone did, but you should try to understand it, and them. Okay, your dad was a jerk, but why was that? Probably because his dad was a jerk to him, and that's all he knows about being a father. Did your friend do something completely out of character? What was going on at the time? Was he acting out of the hurt of his recent breakup? Sometimes people do wrong us randomly, and perhaps these offenses are the most difficult to deal with. But even then, the person typically has a screw loose. Something is just not right upstairs. Forgiveness can change your whole perspective on life and people. We come to see others as fellow travelers in this world. Everyone's walking around with various wounds and various capabilities for dealing with those hurts and angers. They're not evil villains who are out to get you, but people stumbling around trying to do the right thing and sometimes failing miserably. Kind of like you. Forgiveness involves taking personal responsibility and shunning victimhood. Being a man means taking personal responsibility for your life, but we often hold on to our grudges because they make for handy excuses, excuses that keep us from finally growing up. We can't forgive our dad for what he did to us because when we do, we will no longer be able to use that as an excuse for our personal failures. We'll have to move forward and accept full responsibility for our lives, and that can be scary. When we hold on to a grudge, we hold on to our identity as victims. We let someone else's actions define us. When we forgive, we decide that we define who we are. Forgiveness puts you in control. By withholding forgiveness, you feel like you've got the upper hand on someone. You can dangle reconciliation on a string, make them continually grovel with contrition. Grudges thus offer the illusion of power and control, yet they can't fulfill that promise. Ironically, the offender is still the one holding your puppet strings. Your mental state is dependent on them. You've made your happiness contingent on another person. You need to show me X and treat me like X for me to be happy. If we wait until the other person is sorry, we're giving them control over us. We're waiting on them. Don't give them that power. When you choose to forgive, you embrace your free choice and agency. No one can make you feel like crap without your permission. Forgiveness grants you freedom. When we hold grudges and plot our revenge, we limit our freedom. Yes, we get to keep the other person in prison and wield that power, but what we don't realize is that we're stuck in jail with them, having to play the role of the ever-vigilant warden. You can put someone in the doghouse, but you better make room for two. Or as the Chinese proverb says, he who seeks revenge should remember to dig two graves. Revenge eats us up from the inside. It's a pile of coals that we hold in our hands, giving off heat while it burns your body. Once you let the other person go, you're not just releasing them, but you're releasing yourself, breaking free from the rotting prison and moving forward. Forgiveness allows us to grow. What people usually won't say out loud is that resentment and anger make us feel powerful, tough, untouchable. And having an enemy and plotting revenge gives our life purpose, a tentpole for our thoughts to revolve around. Where would superheroes be and what would they spend their time doing without an arch nemesis? But this kind of purpose is a dead end and a waste of our valuable energy, consuming us and slowing our progress. When you come to a place of forgiveness, you can start to find meaning in your suffering. You figure out what you'll do differently next time and come to an understanding of how the pain helped you grow and become a better man. Forgiveness can be a platform for leaping forward in life. Forgiveness requires bravery and confronting pain. Blame and bitterness might make you feel powerful and tough, but they're often a cover for the inability to face pain head-on. Holding a grudge against your ex-wife, thinking about how much of a she-devil she is every time she crosses your mind is a coping mechanism. Continually drinking from the well of anger keeps the pain from the dissolution of your marriage at bay. We use bitterness as a way to keep ourselves from having to mourn a loss. Once we let go of the anger, we're forced to confront the pain directly. Forgiveness involves taking a risk. We have to open ourselves up to the past hurt and the potential of being hurt again, and that takes courage. Lastly, forgiveness creates a manly legacy. Perhaps the manliest benefit of forgiveness is the way it enables you not only to be free yourself from being locked inside bitterness, but how it creates a powerful legacy for those who come after you. You may come from a family where generation after generation has been hurting each other and keeping those feelings locked up, sickening the men from the inside. Instead of making the same mistakes with your kids, forgiveness says, the buck stops here with me. You have the courage to acknowledge and feel the pain, and then to let it go instead of passing it on. You have the power to weld a new link in the chain of generations, 
and manliness. This article first appeared on the Art of Manliness blog by Brother Brett McKay of Veritas number 556 in Oklahoma. Read more at artofmanliness.com. A New Beginning by Ian A. Stewart 25 years ago, two California Grand Lodges forged a historic alliance and changed the way we all view Freemasonry. For Del Lauterbach, it was a matter of principle. The longtime preacher and special needs educator, first affiliated with Paul Revere Lodge No. 462 in 1973, and by 1990 he'd joined its officer's line as junior warden. But a question seemed to grate at him. Given Freemasonry's commitment to moral uprightness, why weren't California Masons and Prince Hall Masons, the historically black Masonic fraternity, permitted to sit together in Lodge? Even 30 years ago, that rule seemed like a relic of an even more distant time, like something more likely to be seen a half century earlier in the Deep South than in the Bay Area of the early 90s. So he resolved to do something about it. As it turned out, there was a simple, if not particularly straightforward answer. The most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge, which traces its origins to 1784, has operated continuously in California since 1855, but it and the Grand Lodge of California had never officially recognized one another. As a result, members of the two groups were precluded from pursuing any sort of Masonic work together. Masonic recognition has long been an important tool for establishing connections between Masons around the world. In recent years, it's one of the Masons of California have used to cement those relationships. Since 1923, when it began tracking it, the Grand Lodge of California has entered into mutual recognition with more than 200 Masonic jurisdictions in the U.S. and abroad, with more than a quarter of those occurring since 2000. Those links represent an important bond for Masons. Ask any member who's had the opportunity to attend a ceremony at another lodge, and they'll tell you that the experience is profound, a reminder that the fraternity makes brothers out of people living worlds apart. So in 1990, Lauterbach took it upon himself to introduce a resolution at annual communication, recognizing the regularity of Prince Hall Masonry in California. A fraternity divided along the lines of color is an anachronism of segregation, he wrote. The resolution was a trial balloon. Even assuming that a century and a half of non-recognition could be undone, both Grand Lodges would need to agree to it for any such move to happen. So Lauterbach agreed to withdraw his motion with then Grand Master Ron Sherritt, pledging to appoint a special committee to work alongside Prince Hall Masons to explore the possibility and method of an equitable and just union of those lodges with this Grand Lodge. There may have been miles of track ahead of them, but to Lauterbach and many others, the train had finally left the station. A Historic Step Worldwide, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 Masonic Grand Lodges, each with slightly different traditions, rules, and eligibility criteria. Members of each order consider themselves Freemasons. All of them, however, are barred from visiting or even associating with lodges in jurisdictions that are not recognized by their own. As is often the case with a 300-year-old fraternity, the devil is in the details. On May 18, 1991, there were lots of details to work through. It was on that date, in a room at the Oakland Airport, Hilton, that the first formal meeting between the Grand Lodge of California and the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of California took place. With that, what would become a years-long process was launched to establish the framework for a historic pact. One of the first issues the groups faced was also the most significant historical precedent. Since before the founding of the Grand Lodge of California in 1850, Masonic Grand Lodges throughout the country had subscribed to a concept called the American Doctrine. Put simply, this established that only one Grand Lodge could claim jurisdiction over a given territory, and that any other Grand Lodge working there would be considered persona non grata, or in the parlance of the time, clandestine. Even if a Grand Lodge wanted to recognize another group within its borders, the American doctrine didn't allow it. It was considered a bedrock principle, explains past Grand Master John L. Cooper II. The aim was to impose order on what had become, in certain places during the 19th century, a Masonic free-for-all. The various lodges in a single town might be connected to any number of foreign countries, each of which had its own rules and traditions, and all competing for the same members. To those early Masonic leaders, the very structure and reputation of Freemasonry seemed to be at stake. The American doctrine established a jurisdictional claim in each state, but it also had the effect of marginalizing a great number of Masons, including, in the case of Prince Hall Masonry, many people of color. 
Freemasonry has always stipulated that membership cannot be closed to any qualified prospect on the basis of race or creed. Yet, over the past 200 years, the fraternity has reproduced many of the same patterns of discrimination and segregation seen elsewhere in society. Reports from the early and mid-20th century and the proceedings of the Grand Lodge of California frequently distinguish between white masonry and colored, or Negro, lodges. A report on Prince Hall Masonry published in the 1946 proceedings summarized correspondence from North Carolina, read, The several Grand Lodges of the United States, almost without exception, limit their membership to the white race. The result in many states, including California, was a sort of parallel system in which the mainstream Grand Lodge could not and would not formally recognize its Prince Hall counterpart. But neither did it make overt attempts to shut it down. In 1930, the proceedings referred to Prince Hall Masonry as quasi-legitimate and having a sort of qualified standing with our Grand Lodge. By 1938, it stated that Prince Hall Masonry should be generally termed irregular rather than clandestine, perhaps a semantic difference, but also an olive branch. In 1931, regarding Prince Hall Lodges in California, a Grand Lodge report stated that, in fact, they have been unofficially aided in various ways by officers of the Grand Lodge of California, though no recognition has been or can be extended to them either as a Masonic body or individually. In 1936, as a show of cordial feelings between the two Grand Lodges, Prince Hall Grand Master Theodore Moss gifted a copy of his organization's proceedings dating back to 1904 to the Masonic Library of Southern California. Relations between this Grand Lodge and the White Masons of the state are as close as same could be without recognition, and apparently that relationship is satisfactory to both sides, he said. Over the many decades, this arrangement remained the status quo. Even to those for whom a parallel system smacked of separate but equal, the so-called American doctrine seemed to prevent progress. That was the big roadblock, says Frank Russell, who became chairman of the Grand Lodge Committee on Prince Hall Recognition. So Russell pored over century-old proceedings books and Masonic writings, looking for the basis for the rule. He wrote to researchers at the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin's vast Masonic library and found the first references to the doctrine from around 1840. But what he didn't find was equally important. The doctrine was not written into a single binding document. It certainly wasn't law, though its principle had been enshrined in the California Masonic Code. As far as he could tell, the doctrine was more concerned with protecting a Grand Lodge's jurisdictional claim than dictating who it could recognize. That seemed to leave the committee some wiggle room. We had a really good lawyer and past Grandmaster R. Stephen Doan, Russell explains. Steve said, if we have the right to dictate the confines of our jurisdiction, then we also have the right to recognize who we want to recognize within that jurisdiction. And that's what really opened the door. A welcome reception. Meanwhile, other details of the agreement were being ironed out by the two committees, including some tricky business related to Prince Hall's presence in Hawaii, which has its own Grand Lodge. The biggest remaining holdup was a Prince Hall rule pertaining to plural lodge membership. Whereas California Masons are able to hold memberships in several lodges, Prince Hall limits membership to a single lodge. Prince Hall leaders were adamant that the rule remain in place, in part as a way of guarding against membership drain. There's a strong heritage behind both Grand Lodges since Prince Hall past Grand Master Samuel King. Neither one wanted to lose its identity. Respecting that tradition became a priority during negotiations, and as the sides made progress toward an agreement, the two Grand Lodges began to work alongside each other for the first time. In 1993, then Grand Master R. Stephen Doan became the first California Grand Lodge officer to address a Prince Hall Grand Session when he delivered a speech during its annual Sunday religious service. The same year, Prince Hall Grand Master Harold Muir returned the favor. The following year, representatives from both parties followed suit. In July of 1995, Deputy Grandmaster Charles Alexander became the third California officer to speak at a Prince Hall service, this time directly addressing the matter of recognition. I find it gratifying that the walls which once totally separated us are, like the Berlin Wall, beginning to crumble, he said. Some of our more skeptical brethren have asked me, what do we expect to gain by seeking mutual recognition with Prince Hall Masonry? My answer to that is gain. We are not seeking to gain, but seeking that which is just. He received a standing ovation. Finally, in 1995, five years after Lauterbach's trial resolution set the ball rolling, and with most of the major agreements in place, the committees drafted virtually identical motions establishing mutual recognition between the Grand Lodge of California and the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Lodge of California. 
Masonry was designed to be a brotherhood of man, which need not be an idle dream in the great state of California, said then Prince Hall Deputy Grandmaster Ronald Robinson. The Prince Hall body passed the resolution unanimously. At the Grand Lodge of California's annual communication, it passed 1392 to 124, nearly 92% in favor. History is continually being made up and down this shared jurisdiction, declared a special issue of the Prince Hall Masonic Digest. The barriers are down. There are no excuses. All have the good work to do. The bridge has been built. A Shared Future Far from being merely some procedural vote, mutual recognition has opened the door to a new level of cooperation between the two Grand Lodges. In doing so, it helped deepen the fraternal experience for Masons of all stripes. Since 1996, when the agreement took effect, the Grand Lodge of California has entered into mutual recognition with 35 other Prince Hall Grand Lodges across the United States, Canada, the Caribbean, and elsewhere. In turn, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of California has similarly entered into recognition agreements with the United Grand Lodge of England and countless other bodies. In February 1996, Grand Master Charles Alexander's Home Lodge, Oxnard No. 341, and Prince Hall Grand Master Joseph Nicholas, Unity No. 22, made history by convening California's first intra-lodge meeting. It was only the beginning. Representatives of both Grand Lodges now regularly attend one another's annual communications, and countless Masons have been allowed to peer behind the curtain and sit in on one another's workings. There's been an opening of arms on both sides, says King, the past Grand Master of Prince Hall. It's been outstanding. The partnership has also extended beyond the Lodge Room. California Grand Lodge and Prince Hall Grand Lodge Masons work together on philanthropic efforts, including the Masons for Mixed Glove Drive, and have attended numerous public ceremonies together. That was strongly in evidence in 2014, when more than 400 Prince Hall Masons and their California Masonic counterparts came together to lay the cornerstone for Sacramento's new basketball arena, sending an important, visible signal that California Freemasonry is bigger than any one Grand Lodge. That, say the leaders of both groups, is the future of the fraternity. And while recognition is indeed an important tool, it isn't the only way to work together, says Aaron Washington, Prince Hall's Senior Grand Warden. Through Masonic Partnership, if you have a good idea for something you want to do in the community, it's fantastic that you can get some folks together that are like-minded. There's nothing more beautiful than that. Official recognition has its limits, too. Cooper points out that there are some half-dozen other Grand Lodges operating in the state, only two of which are formally recognized by the Grand Lodge of California. But increasingly, members of the other Masonic groups have been invited to participate in events with the Grand Lodge of California, including the California Masonic Symposium. Most memorably, in 2015, the Grand Lodge of California, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of California, and the Grand Lodge of Iran in Exile co-hosted the World Conference on Freemasonry, sharing the stage together as equals. For Russell, recognition wasn't just historic, it was personal. Though the committee has long since dissolved, Russell is still liaison to the Prince Hall Grand Lodge. Each year he attends its annual convocation, and he often sits in on degree nights for the three Prince Hall Lodges in Sacramento. In 2001, then Grand Master of Prince Hall Masons Herbie Price presented Russell with a plaque declaring him an honorary member, making him, in all likelihood, the only dual member in the history of the state. From the moment I was asked to be on that committee, I've always felt that this was my calling, Russell says. It was like nothing I've ever done before, and nothing I'll ever do again. It was something I was meant to do. So now, an interesting thing with this article is we, my lodge, we actually joined a Prince Hall Lodge in Long Beach. And I'm very sorry, I don't remember the name of the lodge, but we actually joined a Prince Hall Lodge for a first degree. And it was pretty interesting because, uh, as I always like to explain, it's like the same story you know, just slightly different. So, you know, we really enjoyed it. They, they, you know, I mean, we're brothers, right? They treated us great. It was a great time we had. Um, and then we actually had a speaker come and give what I think they call the legend of Prince Hall or the history of Prince Hall as a Masonic education night. So we still uh, keep in touch with them. We have... You know, occasionally um, some shared events, but uh, it was it was a good start. And with that, we'll close out this article. How to really like really listen? Experts from Masonic Assistance and Masonic Center for Youth and Families on mastering the hard work of maintaining harmony, by Ian A. Stewart. 
It's hard to say whether things have always been this way or if our current moment is making it worse, but it certainly feels as though we live on two different planets these days. From politics to science to pop culture, we've drawn our battle lines. That's not to minimize anyone's feelings or beliefs. When you're yelling across the divide, it's almost always from a place of conviction. But the division isn't sustainable. So how can we learn not just to tolerate, but to actually engage each other? Luckily, Masons have resources all around them, including professionals experienced in conflict resolution. California Freemason tapped into that collective brain power for some practical advice on learning to listen, giving an inch, and maybe diffusing a bomb. Lesson 1. Validation, not agreement. Here's an easy one that won't cost you a dime. Tell someone you hear them. You don't have to agree to validate their experience, says Lizette Martinez, the manager of outreach and education for Masonic Outreach Services. Let them express themselves without interruption. Recognize that they may be coming to their position from a different place than you. Validation means acknowledging that you heard what they said and that from their perspective it makes sense that they have the response they have, Martinez says. The biggest misconception is that if you validate someone, you're agreeing with them. It's so very untrue. Lesson 2. Empathetic Listening When counselors from Masonic Outreach Services encounter difficult calls, and they often do, the tool they rely on most is empathetic listening. I know empathy might seem squishy and vague, but it's the foundation for navigating these types of interactions, says Saul Silverman, manager of Masonic Assistance. Describe their position back to them and let them correct you if you've got it wrong. Ask for clarification, says David Quinteros, a therapist at the Masonic Center for Youth and Families. Be aware of your posture and nonverbal communication. If you're pacing around, rolling your eyes, or fidgeting, it shows a lack of interest. You can't argue with how someone feels, so frame the exchange in first-person statements, Silverman advises. Lesson 3. Who's not here? Everyone wants to feel seen. When they sense that they're not, they want to leave. This is particularly important when members have stepped back from their lodge, says Jody Michael, Programs Manager for Masonic Center for Youth and Families. They want people to see that I'm hurt. I disagree. Does somebody notice that I'm not here? That's huge. Noticing people's absence or silence is an important first step to mending a relationship before it's fractured beyond repair. Lesson 4. Establish House Rules Masons have well-established terms of etiquette and engagement. The same rules apply to conflict resolution. Community agreements have always been something I implement in groups, Martinez says. These should be agreed upon by everyone rather than come as a directive from the top. Leadership is about reminding people to play by the rules, Silverman adds. It's really up to the lodge leaders to enforce these expectations and redirect the conversation when necessary. But the Lodge's usual code of conduct doesn't cover everything, so it's important to establish a specific set of norms that ensure everyone feels heard and respected. Someone might say, when I'm speaking, I don't want to be interrupted, Silverman says, or if I say something that offends you, I want you to feel comfortable telling me that. Allowing members to participate in coming up with these rules will make it more likely that they'll be followed. Lesson 5. Know Your Triggers Self-awareness is one of the hardest traits to develop and one of the most important when it comes to dealing with others. Everyone has biases, values, and buttons that get pushed, says Sabrina Montez, Executive Director of Masonic Outreach Services. The first step is being aware of them so that when we're triggered, we know why. That level of self-reflection helps us understand our reactions and gives us the chance to get change them, if that's the way forward. Says Michael of Masonic Center for Youth and Families, other people don't know our biases. We don't wear them on a t-shirt. When people offend our sensibilities, they usually aren't doing it on purpose. They just don't subscribe to the same set of values as us. By separating people from their behavior, we allow them to alter the way they act, Michael says. It prevents them from being labeled, which is never helpful because it doesn't allow for change. Lesson number six, say no supportively. An unfortunate part of the job for Silverman is that he isn't always able to help every person he encounters in precisely the way they might like. You may get requests that cannot reasonably be fulfilled, he says. Instead, be prepared to offer support in other ways. When we get a request for assistance and the person doesn't meet eligibility criteria, we don't just say goodbye and hang up. We offer to provide consultation, information, and referrals. That service is nearly always accepted and appreciated because our time and experience is valuable. So even though the person didn't get what they called for, they hang up feeling supported. 
Lesson 7. Operate from Strength. In the same manner as validating another person's position, it's important to take what Montez calls a strength-based approach to acknowledging what they're trying to accomplish. That means recognizing the positive intention behind words or actions, even if they're off-putting. That opens people up to new ways of accomplishing their goals. If an older member argues that he doesn't want to change how the Lodge holds a fundraising event, try to see the positive side of what he's saying. Perhaps this older member is a tradition holder, someone who wants to preserve the Lodge culture that's important to him. Michael says, Recognizing good intentions creates a space of understanding where you might find compromise. Lesson 8. Don't always focus on solutions. Compromise isn't always the goal, though, nor is closure. The most common mistake people make is being too solution-focused, Martina says. Most of the time, we are more helpful just by being present with our whole self and providing empathy. Quoting the leadership researcher Brene Brown, she says, The truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. And lastly, lesson nine, remember why you're here. The purpose of masonry is finding brotherhood, Quintero says. Everything else, the disagreements and arguments we all encounter, is secondary. Says Michael, stripping it all down, there's commonality there. You're still brothers despite your differences, and that's a great thing. Thank you for listening. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a comment. We enjoy hearing from our listeners. If you really like what you heard, share this podcast with your friends and lodge members. Visit us online at solomonstaircase.org.